recently and the trouble requirements for miners, uh, I think finally this matter is properly put to rest. It took longer than it should have taken. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, with all good intention, South Africa introduced quite onerous requirements for children, especially children traveling with a single parent or a single adult, uh, being able to have letters of consent and sworn affidavits, etc., etc. The intention was, of course, to combat child trafficking. Uh, the effect was we, we were going far beyond what other countries do. And, and from South Africa, having been and still being a family-friendly country to visit, it didn't become a family-friendly uh, country in terms of allowing people to visit. It became very difficult. And so we've, we've gone through quite a long process of changing the regulations which were introduced in 2014, put into effect in 2015. The regulations were changed finally last year. And, uh, and then an unfortunate thing happened. The advisory that was put out by the Department of Home Affairs um, didn't accurately reflect the, the changed regulations. The changed regulations brought what South Africa does with respect to traveling minors completely in line with what the, what the UK does, the way UK handles it, the way Canada handles it. And that is, um, in the event that you are, you know, you're, you're a minor or you're a single adult uh, relative or not relative traveling with a minor, under exceptional circumstances or if there are grounds for suspicion, you may be asked to prove the relationship between the adult and the child in an attempt to avoid any anything that could be in the form of child trafficking. But you would not be required to travel with that documentation. And under normal circumstances, the immigration official will not necessarily ask any questions at all. But if, and so the reason that people are advised to carry documentation with them is that in the event that something arouses the suspicion of the immigration official that you are able to somehow demonstrate that there's nothing to be worried about. If there is something that the immigration official feels uh, still worries him or her, uh, then you are given opportunity to obtain that documentation. So that's the change that has now happened. You're quite right. The airlines were a little bit slow. IATA finally, about a week ago, IATA um, issued the advisory. So I would ask you, the media people, to assist us to make sure that people know. People know that it has changed. And people know that the same applies, this, this, the same measures that are applicable in the UK and the USA and Canada apply in South Africa. On the visa generally, and you specifically wanted to know about Nigeria, uh, India and China, well, clearly, I mean, those are some of our uh, huge potential growth markets. In particular, as part of the top 10, uh, we've got our top 10 biggest outsource, uh, biggest source markets for tourist arrivals, India and China feature there. We're getting approximately 100,000 uh, tourist arrivals from those two countries. Nigeria is a country that has huge growth potential. Uh, but in all of those three countries, uh, that are visa requiring countries, it's difficult and it takes a long time to get a visa. So we, we've eased it somewhat over the last uh, year or so, um, and making it for certain categories of people, it's become easier to get visas to come to South Africa. For example, frequent travelers. So we had this, this agreement signed with China last year that said, uh, you know, we would deal in a particular way, we would make it easier for business travelers and frequent travelers. However, not only for the three countries that you mentioned, we need significant uh, visa reform and we have plans to reform our, our whole visa system, which will then beneficially uh, um, affect every country. Because it's not only Nigeria, I'm quite sure that there are a few Ghanaians here, I'm quite sure that there are Kenyans here as well and that there are many represented here, there are many other uh, media people from countries that require visas for South Africa. So the first thing that we want to do, is really a sort of a three, three part measure almost. First thing is to really take stock of which countries need visas, which countries 
should need visas and which don't. All countries in the world have certain visa requirements. There are very few countries that say, if any, that say anybody from any country can come and visit our country without any visa. So that's the first thing. And, and in the context of a commitment amongst African country, countries to move towards freer movement of people across the African continent. So the first thing is to do that stock take. The second thing is to move as rapidly as possible to an e-visa system. Now, that would not only affect the three countries that you mentioned, uh, but the starting point will be those three countries. So the update on that is, at the moment, the Department of Home Affairs undertook to do a pilot with New Zealand, piloting an e-visa system, and they're, they're, you know, upon completion of the pilot, they will be, and I don't know the time frames or fan, but in the course of this year, moving on to those countries that you mentioned. Our president said very clearly, and when he comes here tomorrow, sharing a few thoughts with, the, uh, with you and others, um, he will repeat this again. He wants to see us, and is pushing us in the direction of having a world-class e-visa system. So that is the pressure on the Department of Home Affairs, and that is the instruction to the Department of Home Affairs, is to move from where we are now to a world-class e-visa system. The third thing, which is not a hard decision, but is something certainly being considered, and that is recognition, which, will, which is in some ways easier to put into effect, um, recognition of still valid visas from certain countries that apply uh, stringent tests. So, for example, if in your passport, let's say the USA, the UK, Schengen visa, Mexico, for example, recognize a valid, recognizes a valid visa to the USA as valid for Mexico. So, that is something that we are giving attention to and is being considered. It's something that the Department of Tourism believes should be put in place and we think it's it's a relatively easy measure, and we're not compromising security considerations at all. On the contrary, those countries apply more stringent security checks than we would ever be able to apply. So those are the three things that we're, we're moving towards. Um, the President has said it repeatedly, and he's a great believer in the importance of the tourism sector and the ability of the tourism sector to contribute to economic growth rapidly and to increase our numbers, to increase them as uh, the DG said, or Blessing said, I can't remember, to uh, 21 million by 2030. It's quite doable. If you do your little calculation from where we are now, to get to the 20 million, it's less than 6% growth per year over the 11 years. That is, that is more or less in keeping with what global tourism growth has been. Uh, and certainly last year, Julian, I think last year the global growth was 6%, something like that. So we think it's achievable, but we have to do all of the right things in order to achieve it, but it's achievable. On your issue of an increase in prices, um, you know, we, we, we are not in the business of trying to regulate the tourism industry or over-regulate it. We think in general, the tourism sector should, you know, certain regulations have to apply necessarily for the safety of customers, for the safety of tourists. Um, so, uh, but in general, we don't believe that this should be a tightly regulated system. So, um, it's difficult for us to introduce price regulations to say, you shall not charge more than X amount of money uh, because we are a free and open economy. So the best way that you can keep the prices relatively low, of course, is through open competition and fair competition. So, uh, you know, if you uh, go up too high in your prices, people have other places to go to. That's the most important for me, for us. We believe that's the only measure that we can, or the only thing that can curb prices. We can encourage, we can encourage hotel owners and guest house, uh, guest house owners not to uh, be too extravagant in their price increases. But at the end of the day, we, we have an open economy, so we can't determine it. The, um, on the issue of 
protecting SAA, maybe the DG will speak a bit more about that. Um, uh, DG has just uh, written me a little comment about that diversity of products. He's quite right. It's not only about accommodation, it's what restaurants charge, um, it's what uh, destinations charge. Um, how much do you pay for that ferry that takes you to Robben Island? <laughs> and so there are yeah, things like that. Um, the, but at the same time, I mean, creating a more competitive environment and maintaining a competitive environment has its own dampener on price increases. Because you increase your price too much, there's somebody else, there's another price to go to. The, um, on the South African Airways, well, actually, no, we, uh, we, we, we do less to protect our own air airline, our own national carrier, than many other countries do. It varies from country to country. But I mean, we, we, we uh, believe in open skies, and we believe in a competitive environment. Uh, we want as many flights to South Africa from a many, as many places in the world as possible. If there's one big change that has happened over the last five years, is the, the increased number of airlines flying to South Africa, to different parts of South Africa. Many more direct flights to Cape Town, more direct flights to Durban, uh, and of course more flights to Johannesburg. So 